And I was going to start, Jody, by saying that, damn, girl, you're prolific. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> 19 novels, you're 45. I'd like to live in your brain for a few weeks because I think it would be a very exciting place to be because it must be working over time. And I hate to be pedestrian by asking you a frequently asked question, but, you know, I've interviewed a number of authors through the course of my career, and I remember just to name drop, Philip Roth <laughs> told me that he writes Stand Enough and John Grisham writes longhand on legal pads. I'm not sure if he still does, but that's what he used to do. And can you just tell us a little bit uh, about your writing regimen? I think I also read that you start a new book mm -hmm. the, the day after your previous one is the day after it's finished or the day after it's published? The day after it's finished. Oh my yeah. God, what is wrong with you? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you don't take a break at all? Well, not, not that way, because I'm usually overlapping books. Um, you know, I, I tend to write one book at a time, to be physically writing one book at a time, although that's a big lie, because I, I was writing two books at one time for this year. But um, it starts for me with a what-if question, and it's something that's keeping me up at night, something that's bothering me, something that, you know, just makes me wonder, what would I do in that situation? And if I continue to think about it, I know it's a really good idea for a novel. And if I keep thinking about it, characters pop up like little mushrooms, and they begin to take the story away from me. And at that point, I stop everything. Do you call security? No, you know, <laughs> here's the thing. It's, it's funny. I've said this many, many times, but writing is successful schizophrenia because I'm paid to hear voices in my head, right? And so, you know. Alrighty then. Right, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but really, you know, it's, just, it's great because you listen to them, but you, you also know that you need to stop and learn as much about those characters as you possibly can because you're the authority. So I, I don't let myself write a word until I've done a boatload of research, and I bet you're going to get to that later. Oh, I, yeah, <laughs> definitely, because, yeah. I mean, among many things, that is such a, a fascinating yeah. topic, the way that you research yeah. books. But before we get to that, I mean, you, you really do... Uh, grapple with big issues, yeah. as you said, things that keep you up at night. I mean, organ donation, gay rights, abortion, death row, bullying, murder in, in Amish country, teenage suicide, the right to die. I mean, uh, to name just some of them, mm -hmm. all kind of ethical uh, dilemmas. And, and I'm just curious, how do you get interested in these topics? Do you read things in the paper? Do you see things on television? Uh, what piques your interest in a particular issue at any given time? It really depends on the on the topic. Sometimes it can be a story that I read. When I was coming up for the idea with Handle with Care, which is about wrongful birth lawsuits, uh, it actually had its genesis here in New York City. I was on a book tour. I had Sunday morning to do nothing, and I picked up a copy of the New York Times, and I read a magazine article in there about a woman who had sued her OBGYN for wrongful birth, and I was fascinated by it, and I couldn't get it out of my mind. So that really started that particular book rolling. Sometimes it could be my mother telling me, nobody knows about the Amish, and if anyone could find out about them, it would be you. <laughs> And that'll be the reason I write. You and your know, mom's you. here tonight, she too. She is. I don't know where she is, but she's Hi. Out there. Hi. Hi, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, and then sometimes it's, um, it's, I think, a much more organic process, something that I've come to worry about because I'm a mom, mostly. Mm -hmm. um, something like, what are the worst things that you could imagine happening to a kid? You know, a child being kidnapped, a child getting sick, a child dying, all of those things which are very natural fears for a parent manifest themselves somewhere in my fiction. And, and I think to some extent, and this is completely wrong, I, I'm very superstitious. I think if I write about it, it'll never happen to me. Isn't that weird? No, but, yeah. no, no, I can see that. No, I can see yeah. that. I can see how, how you'd feel that way. Meanwhile, it, you know, as you mentioned, the research you do really is extraordinary and so fascinating. I know your newest novel is called Lone Wolf, mm -hmm. and sort of whose life is it anyway uh, meets Dancing with Wolves? Not really, but... Um, <laughs> That's it, how we're going to pitch it to Hollywood. That's great. Not, <laughs> not really, but can you tell us a little bit about what this book is? is about and, yeah. and the kind of research you did for sure. it because it's sort of two very different ideas in one novel. Right. Um, the book is about a guy named Luke Warren who is a, a very unique kind of wolf biologist. Instead of studying wolves from afar, he actually goes and lives with a wild wolf pack up in Canada. And um, on literally the first page of the book, he's in a very severe car accident with his daughter who is 17 years old and he winds up in a vegetative state. 
His children are both called to his bedside, and that includes his daughter who's in the hospital, who's 17, but also his 23-year-old son, who is a prodigal son, who left after a huge argument with dad and has been living in Thailand for the past six years. And um, when he comes back, his sister believes that he's the reason the parents' marriage broke up, so they're not getting along, the whole family's at odds. And it's up to the two of them to decide what happens to their father, to basically whether they should pull the plug or whether they should wait and see if something happens. And Kara, the daughter, really wants to wait for a miracle. But um, Edward doesn't. Edward thinks that his dad would want life support turned off and to have his organs donated. Unfortunately, we don't really know if that's because Edward wants revenge or if he's being altruistic. And his sister is going to make sure he doesn't make a decision that can't be reversed. So it's really about the intersection of um, medical choices and morality. It asks if we can keep people alive artificially, is it right to let them die artificially? Uh, if we hasten someone's death to get an organ to save someone else, is that the right thing to do? Those are all the questions that it kind of raises. But it also teaches you an awful lot about wolves. And, um, and that's because, uh, really, one day I woke up thinking about wolves. I'm not one of these crazy wolf people. There are people who follow wolves and love wolves and have wolf cams on their computer. I'm not one of them. But Good. I woke up... No, I'm not. I woke up thinking, you know, wow, you know, there's something about a wolf pack that's like a family. And they function like a family. Everyone has a very prescribed role within it. If you do your job, you're there to stay. And if you don't, you're kicked out. And it seemed to be a perfect metaphor for what was going on in this family situation. What happens when your alpha's gone? Who takes over? Who runs the pack? And you spent some time with wolves, with a guy who actually lives, what's his right. name again? His name is Sean Ellis. Here I was thinking I created this totally unique character, and of course someone, it turns out, had gone and lived with a wild wolf pack. And where so was this? This was in... It was. He lived with a wild wolf pack in the Rockies. Um, he was working with the Nez Perce Indians in Idaho as a normal wolf biologist, decided he really wanted to learn from within. So he went and lived with this pack that he tracked and got accepted into. Uh, he functioned as a numbers wolf, which is kind of like, you know, the wolf that doesn't really do anything but round out the pack to make it look stronger. But they accepted him they in did. the pack. They and, did. And he said, you know, it wasn't that they didn't know he was human. They totally knew he was human. But they needed to know about humans as much as he needed to know about them. So, for example, he wasn't asked out to hunt with them very often because he couldn't move as swiftly as they did. And instead, they would bring him back a haunch of food from the kill, usually one that had been rolled in dirt and feces and urinated upon, and he ate it raw. Mmm. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. How do you follow, do a follow-up for that? But, you know, there was one interesting, <laughs> there was one interesting story, Jody, that I read when I was reading all about your research is that one of the wolves turned on him yeah. at one point. It's mm -hmm. such a cool story. Can you tell that yeah, story? Yeah, it's a really cool story. And I used it in the book because, really, I can't make this stuff up. But um, basically, he, he said that this wolf who he had treated like a brother and who had treated him like a brother, one day they were on guard duty. They were guarding the perimeter of the territory. And this wolf just turned around and started snarling at him and backing him into uh, like an, an open, rotted-out tree. And he was terrified because he had let his guard slip and forgotten this is a wild animal. This isn't my buddy. This isn't a puppy. This is an animal that can kill me at any moment. And the animal was just snapping at him, snarling, and he got very scared, and he basically figured, I'm going to die. I'm going to die, and no one's going to know. I died And he here. kind of backed into Backed this. into the, the tree. And he stayed there for several hours. The wolf would not let him out. And then all of a sudden, the wolf poked his, his nose in and was sort of trying to urge him out of the tree and, you know, licked around his mouth to let him know that it was a friendly gesture. And, you know, this Sean's going, I, I have no idea what's going on. I don't understand it. And it wasn't until he got out of the tree that he saw the claw marks on the other side and the scat that had been left by a bear, a grizzly bear. So basically, this wolf saved his life. Which, Which is, is really so, cool. Yeah, I thought that was a really yeah. cool story. Meanwhile, this Sean guy sounds really weird. I, I, I mean, 